Good morning and welcome to our seminar for today. My name is Steve Hudson. I'm Vice President of Hardware Engineering with Parametrics, a division of Technology for Energy Incorporated. Um, our subject for today is going to be standards of accuracy and traceability. Um, before we get started though, I just want to say this is the latest in our quarantine webinar series. Uh, we've been doing this for several months now um, and uh, just want to say that uh, be sure to tune in later this week on Thursday. We're going to be talking about billing versus metering accuracy. Uh, it goes along really well with the subject for today. Um, billing versus metering accuracy basically uh, is subtitled, if you test your meter, does your customer still get an accurate bill? So please be sure to tune in. Uh, it's a very interesting subject. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to have a couple of questions to get us going. Uh, question number one, this is an easy one. Have you ever had a customer billing complaint? Uh, and the answer to that, of course, is yes. Uh, hopefully they weren't quite as irate as the fellow that you see on your screen here, but uh, this time of year in particular, um, you know, we've been experiencing 100 degree plus weather with the heat index here in Knoxville. Uh, I got my electric bill from the local utility the other day, and yeah, it was about 30% higher. That plus I had to fill up my, my above ground swimming pool. Um, of course, some customers take that pretty well, other customers don't. Uh, they will on occasion get an irate customer, you know, that you know, it just uh, thinks that their bill is just way out of line and as such they want you guys to do something about it. Um, which leads to the second question. Um, so if the customer calls and of course wants to complain about their electric bill, how are you going to prove to that customer that their bill is correct? Well, the easy answer of course is that you're going to go out and you're going to test their meter. Which really brings us to our topic for today, which is when you go out and you test that meter, how do you know that meter is giving you the right answer. The meter tester. Uh, the meter itself may give a very good answer, but the, the next question beyond that would be, um, how does the meter tester give you the right answer? Uh, you probably had occasions where you had to go out actually into the field to the customer site, um, you know, running around to the customer's house or the side of the building. Of course, the customer wants to come out and look over your shoulder. You know, in our case, you know, they'd be looking at an orange power master box and you know, they'd be looking at you and looking at that box and you, of course, run the test and get a, say, a perfect registration. First question out of their mouth is, well, how do I know that orange box is right? Well, once again, that's the topic for today. Um, what we're going to talk about is standards, accuracy, and traceability, and how does that all relate back to that meter test. So the agenda for today, uh, next big question that we're going to answer is, first of all, what is a standard? Um, second question is, what is the difference between accuracy and uncertainty? Uh, those are two terms that get thrown a lot, around a lot in our business, and so we're going to basically talk about, you know, what, what are those two terms and how are those important. Next thing after that we're going to talk about is what is traceability. Uh, traceability is really one of the key factors getting back to the legal aspects of, of why when you run a meter test that if the customer wants to go as far as to call you into court uh, that you'll be able to basically prove beyond a reasonable doubt that yes, that meter test was good and uh, there, there shouldn't be any problem with that. And then finally, how do all these things come together in terms of uh, working for, to make your job easier and uh, make it reliable that you know, once again, when you test that meter, that everything's going to be a, give you a good answer. So we'll start out with the first question. Uh, what is a standard? Well, the word standard is used really in two senses uh, in our industry. Uh, the first one uh, deals with normally when we talk about a standard document. Um, in the world of metering, electricity metering, ANSI is, is really the standards organization that defines that. And one of the main standards that we go on is ANSI C12.1. Uh, that's a document that was put together um, by uh, a set of people from our industry. Um, the ANSI committee gets together twice a year and basically talks about you know, topics of interest to us and, and as such they get together and they eventually publish a document through ANSI um, that basically defines what is a meter. Uh, it talks about the mechanical aspects, the electrical aspects, the environmental aspects. Um, all that's defined in a document that if you go to ANSI.org, you can go and actually purchase those. Um, that's how ANSI actually uh, stays in business is that they sell these standards. Um, I was actually looking at the smart metering package just the other day. Uh, it cost about $900, but you get about I think somewhere between seven, seven to nine standards uh, all dealing with metering. And so um, if you've not ever had a chance to look that, Google that. Google ANSI C12.1 uh, and 12.20 are really the two uh, metrological standards uh, that deal with the, with the electrical and environmental testing of a meter. Um, we didn't, we're, we're not really going to talk about that kind of standard today. We're really going to talk about a reference standard. A reference standard is a, is a piece of hardware that's used to basically measure something. 
Um, if we actually go to the dictionary, the official dictionary, which is the IEEE Publication 100, um, IEEE is the Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineers, so that's sort of the Bible in terms of the, offic the official electrical engineering dictionary. A standard is defined as a laboratory type device which is used to maintain continuity of value in the units of measurement by periodic comparison with higher echelon or national standards. They may also be used to calibrate a standard of lesser accuracy or to calibrate test and measurement equipment directly. Now, what that means in normal English is that it's a box or a device that's used as the reference for everything else to be measured against. If we go back and look at the history of standards, uh, let's take a standard that everybody can relate to, a meter stick. Um, way back in 1799, a group of folks got together and they said, we want to come up with a definition for standard for length. Um, over in France, of course, they were, they were going to use something called a meter uh, as opposed to the foot that we use here in America. Uh, a meter was originally defined as one ten millionth the distance from the North Pole to the equator. Um, they, had, you know, they had already made some, some measurements of that and so they had a pretty good idea of what that is. Um, and so once they determined that distance, they actually went and created a platinum bar um, platinum, they use platinum because platinum is a metal uh, that's not as subject to, to shrinking, to contract, and to expand based on temperature. So they thought that at the time that was probably the best thing that they could make to make sure that this standard was very consistent. Uh, and the idea there was is that this was the standard bar, the standard length of measurement that would be used for every other ruler um, that, was being, that was being made, ruler, yardstick, whatever, meter stick. Um, and so for the course of about 150 years, that was what was used when anybody wanted to make a measurement. That was the reference that they went back to that we said that if we want to have a standard meter that everybody else has to take their rulers or their yardsticks or whatever measurement device and compare it to that bar to be able to say this has been uh, compared to the standard and as such it, meet, it meets up to that. Um, in the year 1960, they actually went and redefined the meter, um, not in terms of a bar of metal, um, but in terms of wavelength of light emitted from a Krypton-86 isotope. Now, you're probably thinking, how in the heck did they take an isotope of something and turn that into a length? Well, it turns out that it, that was a very consistent way to measure something, and the technology by that time had advanced far enough that they knew that the the accuracy of that measurement, we'll talk about more about accuracy and uncertainty in just a minute, but the accuracy of that measurement was far more reliable than just a bar of metal. Um, another 23 years went by and then in 1983 they went back and redefined it once again uh, as having a meter as being defined in terms of speed of light. Speed of light is considered to be a constant, um, 3 times 10 to the ninth meters per second if I remember correctly. Um, but basically, the meter was defined as a certain period of time of something going the speed of light. Uh, bottom line in all this is all of these standards are ways by which um, a, a standards organization, uh, in this case it was the System International, the, the people that define the metric system, had to basically say this is what we're going to use to basically reference everything else in the world that's going to be, uh, that's going to be considered to be a, a, a unit of measurement. Uh, and once again, one of the big things that you see is that as our technology has improved, um, the way that the definition of the standard has changed. And so that, that's something very important that we're always trying to make it more and more accurate, more and more repeatable um, in terms of a way to do that. Um, so I, I, I used the term accuracy a minute ago. Most people sort of assume accuracy um, is, is basically how close to a measurement do I get. If I go back to the IEEE 100, the definition of accuracy is the degree of correctness with which a measured value agrees with the true value. Um, now, if you look at that, there are a couple of key words there. Um, first word there is correctness, basically meaning how close to a given value. Um, at the end of that definition is, is the term true value. True value basically means that at some point you have to determine what is truth, what is, what is your reference of that. Uh, in the case of length that we just discussed a moment ago, that's a, a standard bar, uh, piece of metal, wavelength of an atom, uh, some distance of the speed of light, um, some value that's agreed upon really is what it boils down to. And, and so as such that standards organization comes up with that and then everybody else basically has to use that as their true value. Um, ANSI C12.1, which is the primary uh, standard document in metering, 
states that accuracy is defined as the extent to which a given measurement agrees with a defined value. So once again, what you see there is some of the same keywords. Uh, the extent to which a given measurement agrees, so once again, I'm making a measurement and it's a matter of how close is it to that defined value. Defined value and true value are sort of interchangeable terms, once again, going back to um, a standard unit of measure. The only problem with the word accuracy is that it is a little bit of an imprecise definition because it provides no quantitative guidance. It gives you a number, um, but if you go and look at that in a statistical sort of way, it doesn't give you basically an idea of how much variance there is in that. And so as such, another standard, uh, the ANSI Z54, uh, sorry, Z540-2 standard, um, came up with a different term, which is uncertainty. Um, uncertainty basically is, is another term that's used in conjunction with accuracy. Basically say, okay, my accuracy is, is this number, um, but I have another number on top of that, usually a plus or minus, that sort of quantifies that. Uh, if we go back to the example we had earlier of the length, if I, if I take that meter stick and I take my meter stick to compare to it, and basically I go and I measure that, say, 10 times in a row. Let's say I get a little bit of variation in my measurements. Sometimes I might measure 9 point, uh, 0.99 meters. Sometimes I might measure 1.1 meters. Um, that variation in that measurement is, will eventually come out to be an uncertainty, um, basically to say that I can measure it a certain number of times and that there'll be some variation in that measurement. And the uncertainty is basically how much variation that I have in that. Um, getting back to accuracy for a minute, accuracy uh, can also be called trueness. And once again, it's based upon an agreed upon value, reference value. Once again, the reference value is that standard, uh, is that meter bar or whatever other thing it is that you're trying to compare it to. Um, we start talking about error in a measurement. Error is the difference between a measurement and the true value. Uh, once again, if I was measuring that meter stick and I got 0.99 meters, my error in that situation would be 0.01 meters. Um, and uh, errors can be represented as two different ways. Uh, a systematic error, which is typically a shift in all measurements in a certain direction. Um, what that can be attributed to most of the time is either due to a miscalibration of an instrument or perhaps maybe you're always sort of leaning in the same direction. And so it's, it's a, an error that you'll get over and over and over again just because it's, it's built into the way that you're doing the measurement. Another type of error is random error. And random error is, of course, random in that it varies in an unpredictable way. Um, random error may come from a lack of equipment sensitivity, basically meaning that you know, your equipment just isn't sensitive enough. If, if I was trying to get you know, one one thousandth of a meter accuracy and my device just couldn't do that, then basically I'd say you know, I can't get down to that level. Uh, another thing in electronic measurement is noise. Uh, noise is, is inherent in a lot of different systems, but in electricity, electrical noise basically is this random component that comes from various different attributes of, of, of physics that adds to the uncertainty uh, due to the randomness and random nature of noise. And so both of those add together basically to, to go into your uncertainty. Um, uncertainty is a precisely defined statistical quantity which enables a user to determine the possible error in the measurements. Once again, uncertainty and error go together to sort of help you see that. Um, here's a graph that gives you maybe a little better graphical representation of what that is. And so once again, what we're looking at here is a graph of, of trueness or accuracy uh, versus precision. Um, if we, a lot of folks like to use the, the, the good old-fashioned example of a, of a target. You know, and so if, if I'm really accurate, basically what I have to define, first of all, is you know, what is my goal? What is, what is the thing I'm, I'm trying to achieve? Um, and the target, of course, it's the bullseye. I'm aiming for that bullseye, and so ideally every time I shoot my gun, um, I'm trying to hit that bullseye. And so if I'm really accurate, the closer I am to that bullseye, the center of that target, the more accurate, the more true I'm considered to be. Um, precision, on the other hand, means that I'm very consistent. Um, if I look down the lower left-hand corner, you may see that I've got a group of shots, those red-colored shots, that are all in the same area. They're not close to the bullseye, but they're all close together. And so what that means is that I'm, I'm precise, but I'm not accurate. Um, ideally, I want to be both. I want to have both precision and accuracy, uh, which is the upper right-hand corner, the green shots, meaning that I'm very close to the bullseye and all of my shots are very close together. Um, but if you talk about the uncertainty of that measurement, basically it's the grouping. It's basically 
you know, how much deviation is there in each of those measurements to be able to say, you know, what is my uncertainty in that measurement? You really need to, once again, have both accuracy and precision to be able to minimize your uncertainty because that's, that's really the ultimate goal is to try and make your measurements as accurately as possible as, as, with as, as least amount of uncertainty as possible. Um, so all that being said, um, really when I report a measurement, I really have to do two things. I have to report a value, uh, which a lot of times is given as the accuracy, and an uncertainty because that basically says I'm, I ended up with this value, but I also had this uncertainty, which basically says that I had this much deviation possibly in the measurement. Um, once again, I tried to make several, several measurements and so I can get that uncertainty down to as small a value as possible. Um, a lot of the standards require that uncertainty be expressed as a variance uh, with a specific coverage factor. Now, those are, those are terms from statistics. And so as such, what we have to do next is we basically have to say, okay, what, what do those terms mean? Um, if you've taken a course in statistics, you probably know that statistics, of course, is based upon um, making lots and lots of measurements and then going in and analyzing that data in such a way that you can start to quantify things. Uh, one of the most common terms in statistics is the standard deviation, uh, basically, which is how far does a measurement spread? You know, once again, if I'm taking that measurement of that meter stick and I take 10 measurements and I get measurements of 0 0.99, 0 0.97, 1.1, 1.2, um, if I go and I run a statistical analysis on that, the standard deviation is basically going to be if I take the average of that measurement and then I look at how far each of those measurements deviates from that average, that's going to end up being my, my standard deviation. Um, and so basically that means that if somebody else goes and makes that same measurement in the same sort of way, the hope being that they will fall within the same standard deviation of that. Um, coverage factor, um, which is represented by the letter K, is basically a percent probability that, uh, that a given, any given measurement will fall within a standard deviation of that. And so if I say K equals one, um, this is a normal bell chart, by the way, uh, standard distribution. Um, K equals one means that 68.3% of the time, I will fall within one standard deviation of my measurement. So, you know, if I said my, my accuracy was 1.0 plus or minus 0.1, uh, if that 0.1 is my standard deviation, that means 68% of the time when I make that same measurement, I'm gonna fall within that 0.1 uh, meter measurement, part of the measurement. If I want to be even more certain that I'm going to get that, I could say K equals two, which means stan two standard deviations. Um, that's going to mean 95.5% of the time, I'm going to end up with two standard deviations, 0.2 meters in this case, of that. And then finally, I'd say K equals three, that'd be 99.7. So what you see is really, you're, you're trying to get more and more confidence that your measurement is accurate. Really, I'm spreading out the uncertainty um, but I'm elevating the coverage factor. I'm elevating the probability that my measurement is going to be uh, within reason. Uh, getting back to C12, uh, if I talk about C12, um, basically, you know, the thing that we care about in metering is, is a power measurement. Um, and so the thing that we're going to use is going to be an electric power standard. Um, C12 defines really how accurate that that standard needs to be. And so they, they have two different kinds of standards. They have a portable standard and a reference standard. Um, reference standard is typically, if you've got one box in your laboratory that you trust more than anything, and you wanna compare it back to add, that, that is, that's your reference standard in the laboratory. Um, ANSI C12 defines that if I'm making a, a measurement against a meter, against a reference standard, that reference standard has to have an accuracy, a power factor of unity of better than 0.02%. Um, if I use a portable standard, which is a standard typically that I'm going to go and probably take out in the field and use uh, to do meter measurements or use in other parts of, of my utility, um, that can be up to 0.05%. And so what you see is that, you know, depending on the level of the standard depends on, you know, what percent error that they're, they're willing to accept. Um, typically, the farther away you get from the perfect standard, the greater the error is going to increase. Um, the only problem with that is, once again, they don't give that in terms of a uncertainty. Uh, it doesn't have any sort of variance, any sort of coverage factor. It's just an absolute value. Um, and so as such, you, you really want to try and understand what uncertainty goes into that measurement um, because that's, that's a key part of that. Um, 
Let's switch gears and talk about traceability for a minute. Traceability uh, is basically uh, the property of a result of a measurement whereby it can be related to an appropriate standard. Um, the, the standard usually at the top of the chain is a national or international standard. Um, and so the, the trick with traceability is, is that you really want to be able to take whatever that you're using in your utility and be able to trace that all the way back up to a national standard. Once again, back in the olden days, you know, you had that meter stick that everybody else would go and take, take their, um, their ruler or whatever it was they were trying to compare and they compared against that. Um, in America, um, you know, we basically have NIST. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, it's based up in Washington, D.C. And so as such, they basically have a standard way of, of measuring things, including a watt hour. Um, watt hours measure of energy, not really power. Watts is power, watt uh, hours is energy. And so as such, if you have a watt hour standard, that basically at some point needs to be traced back up to a national standard, such as the one that they have at NIST. Um, traceability is often one of the most challenging things for validating uncertainty, especially for power. Um, but NIST basically has gone to the point of being able to quantify that so that they can, they can basically certify a, a, a device all the way down to 0.002%, uh, which is 20 parts per million. Um, that's really, really good. Um, most meters are 0.2%, so that's two orders of magnitude better than a typical meter uh, that you're running out there. Um, most standards that you buy, um, your reference standards are typically going to be maybe an order of magnitude greater than that, in the order of 0.02% to 0.05%. Um, but basically what, what you understand is that, the, that those lab standards have also been traced all the way back to that one standard that's 0.002%. So once again, what you're seeing here is that as you get farther and farther away from the golden standard, which is the government standard, um, you get more and more, um, more, and more error uh, more and more uncertainty. Um, the A2LA is an organization uh, basically that does a, another certification called 17025 certification. Uh, it's basically a standard for certifying a laboratory. And so if you have a laboratory at your utility, basically A2LA is an organization that could come in and basically do a, a 17025 certification uh, to help you set up and maintain rules by which you run the laboratory. Um, once again, one of the main things that, that you care about there is traceability uh, because, once again, that establishes a paper trail uh, from your standards back to those national standards so that if any of your measurements are ever called into question, once again, if you've got that customer that's really, really mad about his bill and wants to basically carry it all the way to court, um, you need to have that traceability to basically be able to prove that, yeah, look, my standard was checked on a regular basis. It was checked against a national standard that everybody else is comparing against. And so as such, when I go out and run a meter test, I've been able to prove that traceability back to that. Um, we call that the unbroken chain of comparisons, basically meaning that, that you know, your meter testers were compared against your lab standard, your lab standard was compared against the national standard, and once again, you have paperwork that traces back all the way to that. Um, in each step of that chain of comparisons, you basically need to document the uncertainty, uh, the accuracy of the measurement and the uncertainty, so that once again you see that statistically speaking that your measurements were within those, those defined limits. Uh, that's very important because once again that, that's established based on a set of rules um, that everybody in the world really has agreed to, uh, to say that this is the way that these measurements are going to be done. Um, another part of the A2LA certification is competence, basically. They go in and they basically make sure that you have uh, training methods, basically, to say, hey, you know, when, if I've got 17025 certification, I've got a document that says this is how uh, my employees are going to be trained, this is how often they're going to be trained, these are the training materials. Um, that's another documentation, another piece of documentation in the paper trail to basically show that your employees are competent because they have been trained and that there's records to be able to prove that. Um, another big part of A2LA is it's a reference to SI units. Uh, that's metric, metric system. Um, really, you always want to try and use the same units. Uh, whenever folks try to start uh, changing units, there's, there's always going to be some concern that you know, the calculation, the translation was not done correctly. Um, so they do mandate that we use a standard, uh, a standard of metric system units. And then finally, um, Things have to be calibrated. Uh, we're going to talk about calibration more at the end, but calibration basically means that once again you're checking those things 
uh, at an appropriate interval. Um, most of the time, most folks do it once a year. Uh, and so if you have a lab reference standard, you're going to send that back to whatever authority it is that you want to compare that against, and they're going to check that on that regular basis. And that goes, once again, back into the paper trail to show that you're doing that on a regular basis and not just whenever you feel like it, or once every five or six years. You know, you're, you're doing it very regularly, thereby showing that things have not drifted over a period of time. Um, and so if we finally get down to what is a power standard, um, once again, if we go back to the ANSI standard, C12.1, the definition of a basic reference power standard is those standards with which the accuracy of the water hour meter is maintained in the laboratory. Such standards are regularly intercompared with a reference standard to maintain the history of the behavior. So once again, you see the same language that we saw in the A2LA document, um, where we're doing a regular intercomparison of, of our meter test equipment with those standards to make sure that they're still accurate. Um, we're doing that on a regular basis, uh, and we're documenting that to make sure that we have a good paper trail uh, to maintain all that. Um, this is sort of a, a top-down view of that, where on top you've got NIST. NIST is the, once again, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, based in Washington. Um, they've got a standard set of units that they use to basically create a watt hour. Um, from that, they're able to take a reference standard and that you can send it to NIST and basically have your reference standard checked against that, and they'll basically give you a measurement of how accurate that device is with some uncertainty. Um, normally that will come back to your lab and then you'll basically take your transfer standards underneath that and compare it to, to, your, to your main standard and basically once again establish what is the accuracy of, of those devices compared to that other device that was sent out for compar comparison with NIST uh, with some accuracy under that. Um, if we look at uh, the accuracy of of typical things, when you look at NIST, NIST can actually certify all the way down to 0.002%, um, which once again is 20 parts per million, with uncertainty of k equals 2. If you remember that Bell distribution curve, basically what you had there is that that means about 96% of the time any measurement made on that device is going to fall within two standard deviations of that. And so once again, that, that's about the best measurement that we can get. Um, NIST is part of an international group of standards laboratories. Uh, they actually have a mutual agreement so that um, they send their own standards uh, to other places around the world to basically do intercomparisons uh, just to make sure that, you know, if you ever had a standard that was from, say, England or Germany, um, that standard had also been compared against the NIST standard. Um, some people actually uh, consider it to be that the U.S. isn't the best standard. There are actually some that are considered to be better. Once again, it depends on who you ask. Um, but here in America, we, we all go back to NIST. Um, here at Parametrics, our lab reference standard is based off of a Fluke product, uh, the Fluke 6105A. Uh, that product is actually better than 0.01%. And so what you see there is there's about twice, as, twice the accuracy that the, NIST, that the NIST standard will be compared to. Like I said, NIST can actually do all the way down to 0.002. So in that sense, the, the NIST standard is actually five times better than that lab standard. Um, we take those same standards to calibrate all the PowerMaster equipment that goes out uh, to everyone uh, uh, around the country, around the world. Um, our standards are anywhere from 0.02 to 0.05 percent. So once again, that, that uh, Fluke standard is anywhere from two times to five times, in some cases ten times better than that. And so once again, that's our, our means of traceability. Uh, to show that you know every PowerMaster device is calibrated in such a way so that uh, it goes through that lab reference standard and then all the way back up to a national standard like NIST. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, you know that that the NIST basically has to use a standard set of measurements, a standard set of units. Um, this is a, a standard unit wheel. Basically, it shows the 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 seven different things that are actually used to make any other measurement. Um, typically, when we talk about a power measurement, you know, we think about if it's a DC measurement, watts is, watts is our unit of measurement, it's equal to volts times amps. In the AC world, it's equal to volts times amps times power factor. Now, the problem is there is no standard definition for a volt and there's no standard definition for power factor. And so what that means is if I'm trying to take an AC power measurement, I really have to go back to a more standard unit of definition. Um, if I get back into physics of it, a watt can also be defined as a kilogram times a meter squared times um, uh, a second cubed, per second cubed. 
Um, and those are three things that the um, NIST actually has a standard for. We have a standard unit of weight, uh, which is the gram or kilogram. We have a standard unit of length, which of course was that meter stick, and then we have a standard unit of time, which is a second. And so they've taken those three standards and they basically tie them all together in such a way that they can produce a, a watt and then a watt hour. Um, and so, once again, when you send your watt hour standard up there, they actually plug it into that box and, and run that comparison um, with, the, with the standard device that is compared against all those other things. Uh, we have a link there that if you want to click on that, you can get a lot more information about how those standards are actually put together. Um, I've actually had the opportunity to talk with Tom Nelson, uh, who's one of the fellows in charge of the NIST Standards Lab. Uh, he's actually the guy in charge of the ANSI committee. Um, and he basically told me, I asked him, Tom, well, what does this thing actually look like? Well, he said, actually, it's a tower. It's a big box full of, rack full of electronics. And so if you can imagine, you basically, if you go to NIST in Washington and take your standard, it plugs into that and basically goes and runs it for some period of time uh, to be able to generate a volt and an amp and, uh, and at some given power factor to be able to do an inner comparison of those standards. Um, at power metrics, you know, one of the questions we have is, you know, what, what is the power standard actually in the power metrics box? Well, it, the, the reality is it's built into the box. Each and every power master unit has a built-in standard, a three-phase standard at that. Um, so once again, the way that we basically make sure that those work properly is, is that we run a calibration. Um, now, calibration is made up of two parts. Uh, it's made up of an adjustment and a verification. Um, adjustment is just that, basically meaning that if I take a power master and I plug it into our calibration system, uh, which is the Model 8900, basically uh, the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to do what's called an as-found, meaning that it will go and actually uh, take that fluke standard, which can generate very precisely a, a volt and an amp, put that into the system, um, and do an air comparison. Let's say it, it puts in 120 volts and 5 amps, and it measures it in the box and says, well, okay, I got 119.9 volts, and I got 4.99 amps. And so it basically says, okay, um, I see that there's a little bit of deviation um, from my standard, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate that difference, and I'm going to apply a, a digital uh, algorithm to basically do an adjustment to get that back to where it should be. And so for a Powermaster box, it actually goes through anywhere from, you know, about 70 to a couple hundred different points, uh, voltage, current, and power factor phase angles, to be able to make sure that that box falls within its given accuracy. Uh, once the adjustment is done, we then do yet another set of measurements, uh, which is the verification stage. Verification is the process of determining how close the device is to the accepted standard. So we do the adjustment first, and then we do the verification, which we also call an as-left, just to make sure that, once again, that device is well within uh, the stated accuracy that we put on our data sheets. Um, and that process takes anywhere from, say, an hour to three hours, just depending on the, the accuracy of the unit. Um, now, what we recommend that, for those of you that have Power Masters, you should send that back to the lab to have that checked at least once a year. Um, the reason being that, you know, once again, that establishes that traceability uh, in doing that on a regular basis back to, to the standards laboratory. Once again, our equipment is certified all the way up to a national standard. Um, and so, as such, you know, that gives you traceability. Um, it also basically makes sure that if there has been any sort of drift or uh, misadjustment in the unit, that that unit will be adjusted back to the ideal value. Um, and so that's a very important process um, that not every customer does, but we certainly do highly recommend that, that you do that because that does make a difference in the accuracy of your measurement and once again does provide you the traceability that you need to legally be able to, to prove that the box is making a proper, proper measurement. So in summary, um, standards are tools that we use as part of the process of establishing the uncertainty associated with the measurement. Um, once again, the standard is the agreed upon um, value, uh, agreed upon piece of hardware that everybody else compares against to make sure that we're all measuring the same thing in the same way. Traceability allows us to establish a reference back to that standard, thereby giving confidence in the measurement. Once again, that's a, that's a process that involves, uh, involves doing it on a regular basis, involves doing it with different pieces of equipment to make sure that you compare one to another, making sure that you do it on a regular basis to make sure that everything is, is done uh, on the up and up. 
Uh, and then finally, we often speak of accuracy, but the standards really deal in uncertainty. You have to have an uncertainty go with your accuracy because that basically tells you a number as well as how much variation you may have in that measurement. Once again, we're trying to get the uncertainty down to as low as possible uh, just to make sure that we give you the most accurate measurement as possible. Um, a lot of times we'll use those terms interchangeably. Uh, if they're fully specified, you can do that. Um, but really you need to understand that, you know, those are two things that go along with that measurement. Um, so once again, that's our presentation for today. Um, if you would, once again, join us back on Thursday uh, to discuss billing versus metering accuracy. Um, once again, that's a really uh, good seminar because it once again just says if you're only testing the meter, uh, is, your, is your customer really getting a proper bill? And what it'll do is it'll do a deep dive into many of the other things besides just the meter that can cause the customer to get an accurate bill. So please be sure to tune in. Thank you very much for your time.